Hey, this is Mark Leach with Sims Math, and today we're talking about linear regression. In this example, we'll be looking at computer outputs and how to read them and get the information we need from them, interpreting slope, interpreting R, and also just determining whether or not a model is appropriate. In a moment, you'll need to pause the video, read the question in all of its parts, grab a piece of scratch paper, and try the question to the best of your ability. Once you get done with that, just press play and I'll be there to give you the solutions and a little bit of extra information as well. So go ahead, pause the video, and try this out on your own. Alright, welcome back. So let's take a look at finding the equation of the least squares regression line from the above computer output. Before we do, let's break down this computer output a little bit. First, you can think of this top part kind of like a table. So let me draw a line right here. Above that line, you can think of these as like column headings. And then let me draw another line. To the left of that line are row headings. So looking at this table, we have a clear header and then two rows titled by constant and wildebeest. Beneath the table is a line of just three pieces of information. This has nothing to do with the table above. They're not in any columns. They're just giving us these numbers because we might need them. Next. Let's cover up some unnecessary information. Those right three columns aren't really going to be helpful to us until much later in the year when we're talking about inference with linear regression. And that R squared adjusted, you're not going to be needing this in an introductory stats course like AP Statistics. So now I've made this table be a whole lot simpler. We have four numbers that we have to deal with. First, I do want to talk about that S because we're not going to be looking at it within this example. S is the standard deviation of the residuals. There's a previous video where I talked a little bit more about that S. So go check it out. All right, so now we need to write our equation. So first, let's talk about the thing that's labeled constant. The number that's the coefficient associated with a constant, or just the constant itself, is the y-intercept. So that's going to be good to know. So let's talk about wildebeest this negative 0.05 number. So this number is the coefficient. That's what COEF in the header stands for. It's the coefficient associated with our predictor variable wildebeest. So our x variable has a coefficient of negative 0.05762. That means that that number is the slope. As a reminder, the form of the linear equation we're going to use is y hat equals our y-intercept plus our slope times x. The y-intercept could be b null or a. The slope might be referred to as b1 or b, depending upon in AP stats, whether you're looking at the formula sheet um, or your calculator or your textbook. So let's fill this in. Let's start with our y variable. If you recall from the first slide, we're talking about percent of grass burned. And don't forget, we got to make sure we have our hat on top of it. That hat represents predicted. So this is the predicted percent of grass burned. Next, we need to write our y-intercept, so 92.29. Then we're going to have a minus. It's a minus because it's a negative slope. Next, let's write our slope. So 0 0.05762. We're going to multiply our slope times the x variable, which is wildebeest. The question was so kind to remind us to define any variables that we use. So that's why we wrote percent burned and wildebeest in the equation itself. If you chose not to do that, you could write the equation with just y's and x's, and then beneath it say that y equals percent burned and x equals wildebeest. My personal preference is to put it in there. I've seen students receive zero credit on a question like this because they did not define the variables and they left off the hat. So you can have the correct numbers, but get no credit because you left off the context and that predicted hat. So make sure you always include the predicted hat, find the variables in context, either in the equation or to the side of it. I just put it in the equation. Letter B, explain what the slope of the regression line means in this setting. So our slope is at negative 0.05762. And if you recall from your days in algebra, slope is just the change in y over the change of x. So let's say that that is equal to negative 0.05762, but that doesn't look like a fraction that we're used to. 
So let's just stick it over one. What always helps me answer this question is to write down beside my slope, my variables in context. So since it's the change in y over the change in x, what is our y variable? Well, it's the percent of grass burned. So it's percent of grass burned over my x variable, which is the number of wildebeest. I can use this picture to help me write my slope sentence. But there's a slight problem. We're told in the stem of the question and also in the computer output that wildebeest is out of every thousand. So if I have one on the x-axis, that's actually representing thousand. If I have 15, that's 15,000. So I need to make my change of x reflect that. So for every additional thousand wildebeest, we predict a decrease of 0.05762% burned. So let's actually write what I just said down. So the first thing you should write is the denominator for every 1,000 additional wildebeest. Next, let's basically just write the numerator. The model predicts a decrease. Now, why is it a decrease? It's because the slope is negative. A decrease of 0.05762% of grassy area burned on average. So there you have it. There's our interpretation about slope. Before we move on, I need to point out two things. The first of which is the word predicts and on average. I call those words my fudge words, or more formally, my non-deterministic words. They help me communicate that this linear relationship is not deterministic, meaning it is not for every 1,000 additional wildebeest, there will be a decrease of 0.05762% of grassy area. No, 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 no. It's just what we're predicting. It's what we expect to happen on average, what tends to happen, what we've seen that usually happen. We're not making it very strict and rigid. It's what we expect to happen. It's all those sort of kind of fudgy, fuzzy words. So you want to make sure that you include one of those. I teach my students to say predicts and on average, just so we have all of our bases covered. And secondly, I want to point out that if it doesn't make sense to you, why are we caring about a decrease of 0.05762% grassy area burn when that doesn't seem like a lot? Might sometimes be helpful to move that decimal place a little bit to the right or to the left. In this case, if I think of the slope as being negative 5.762% for every 100,000 additional wildebeest, that makes a little bit more tangible sense. So I could write my sentence like this. For every 100,000 additional wildebeest, the model predicts a decrease of 5.762% of grassy area burned on average. That makes a little bit more tangible sense. And if you look at the scatter plot, that sort of kind of fits with our scale as well. Next, let's talk about correlation. Correlation, as you recall, is R. So where's R in our computer output? I don't quite see it, but I do see an R squared. That R squared is quite literally R squared. So how do I go from R squared to just R? Well, as my students joke about it, you can unsquare it, or mathematically, you square root it. So let's square root both sides of that equation. But recall what you learned from your algebra years about square rooting numbers. You must include a plus and a minus. But R can't be both positive and negative at the same time. That doesn't work. R either communicates that the linear relationship is positive, or R communicates that the linear relationship is negative. It can't be both positive and negative at the same time. So how do we know which one it is? Well, take a look at the slope. Looking at the slope gives us a clue. Because if my slope is positive, R will be positive. If the slope is negative, R will also be negative. So since our slope is negative, that means that R is negative and I'm not going to use positive at all. So I can say that R is a negative square root of 0.646. So all we need to do is find what the square root of 0.646 approximately equals. We do that and we get that R is approximately equal to negative 0.804, which should make sense because 8 squared is 64, a number just slightly greater than 0.8 gives you a number just slightly greater than 0.64. So now all we need to do is interpret R. So to do that, we can just say that the linear relationship between the number of wildebeest and the percent 
of grass burned is negative and strong. Let me highlight a few things that are crucial in this sentence. The first is linear. You have to say that R is a measurement of linear strength. So I get that taken care of right out of the gate. That the linear relationship is negative. So we know that R is negative because what we just talked about a second ago. The number is negative. That means also the relationship is negative because the slope is negative. And then it's a strong relationship. We know that it's strong for a few reasons. Negative 0.8 is within the boundary lines for saying that something is strong. And if you recall what the scatter plot looked like on the first slide, the linear relationship between number of wildebeest and percent of area burn was pretty tightly compacted. If you were to draw it an oval around those dots, it would be pretty skinny. So we're confident to say that it's strong. And lastly, you got to make sure that you have context. So there are four main things you got to talk about when you talk about R. You have to say that it's linear. You have to say whether it's positive or negative. You have to give a measurement of strength, weak, moderate, or strong. You can also say moderately strong or moderately weak. And lastly, the context. You got all four of those, you'll get yourself full credit. And just one other note is that instead of saying the word relationship, you could also say the word association. In this course, relationship, association, they're pretty interchangeable. But remember, the word correlation is reserved specifically for the measurement of linear strength. The astute student will notice that a phrase like this is very similar to just being asked to describe the relationship or the association of a scatter plot. And that's true. I like to have my students make the correlation be slightly special by saying that it's the linear relationship between blah, 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 instead of just saying the relationship between these things is negative, linear, and strong. I like to get that linear out there first. Lastly, is the linear model appropriate for describing the relationship between wildebeest abundance and percent of grassy area burn? Whenever you see a question asking about whether a linear model is appropriate, you should instantly be thinking of the residual plot. And that's what they gave us. Before we write down what we should say, let's talk about where this residual plot came from. Well, it starts with a least squares regression line. And from that line to every point, we have residuals. So I've highlighted six of these residuals. I want you to imagine that those six lines are solid sticks that are connecting the point to the line. If I grab the line and just flatten it, then those residuals stay vertical, we'll end up getting these six lines below on the residual plot. So what happens is we are subtracting out the linear relationship between number of wildebeest and percent of grassy area burned. And then what we're seeing in the bottom residual plot is the leftover relationship when I get rid of the linear relationship. The leftover relationship isn't all that much. It doesn't look like it's going anywhere. There's no curve. There's no other line. It's just kind of blah. And actually, that's what we're looking for. Because if when I subtract out the linear relationship, there is nothing really left over, that tells me that this linear model does a pretty good job of representing this scatter plot. That whenever I get rid of it, there's no relationship left. Just a bunch of dots. So let's say that. So it, we were asked a yes or no question. It says, is a linear model appropriate? So the first words that come out of your mouth better be yes or no. So is a linear model appropriate? Yes. Then state the rest of your answer. Yes, because there is no obvious leftover pattern in the residual plot. If you're given a residual plot, then you can just cite it. If you're not given a residual plot, then you need to sketch a residual plot. It could be something that should take you like 30 seconds to make. Just make a quick sketch of it. Make sure to label your axes with numbers and words as well. But a quick sketch of it so that way the reader knows what you're looking at. And then make a statement like this because there's no obvious pattern left over in the residual plot. An important note to make here is this. We use the residual plot to determine whether the linear model is appropriate. We do not use R. I can have an R that's very strong, 0 0.95, 0 0.97. But yet, when I look at the residual plot, I see that there is still a curve in that residual plot. A lot of somewhat curved graphs 
have a very strong R. But when you look at the residual plot, there's that curve left over in the plot showing that there's actually a curved relationship that's even stronger and even better than the line that we're trying to use. So we never use R to determine if a linear model is appropriate. We use the residual plot. So if this video helped you understand how to find the least squares regression line from a computer output, interpreting slope and R, and determining whether a linear model is appropriate or not. Thanks for watching and see you next time.